Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 213. Good work can be ignored, but great work cannot be denied. Carol Kirshner. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community for filmmakers that transforms them for being workers and people who work for others to being creators and owners of their own content and make passive income from the global marketplace. Black Box currently allows creators to upload stock footage once and get to many agencies and then allows to share their passive income streams with other collaborators. It's quite revolutionary, and it's a great work-life hack for filmmakers and video creators. Think of it as a side hustle while you're getting your movies and your projects off the ground. For more information, visit blackbox.global. That's www.blackbox.global, and discover how you can start generating extra revenue for yourself. So guys, I'm sorry I'm a little bit behind on the podcasting this week. I am going nuts trying to get everything ready for Sundance, and I am, as they say, only one man. I cannot tell you all the insane stuff we got going on for Sundance this year, and I'm going to be hopefully putting out a lot of podcasts while I'm there. I'm going to do the best I can to do as many as I can, uh, but if not, they're all going to be coming out on YouTube and on the podcast. And in the spirit of Sundance, uh, Adam Bowman from Media Circus and I have put together a survival guide to Sundance. So we're going to be putting that out over the next few days uh, and the coming week during Sundance. We have 10 tips on how to survive Sundance if it's the first time you're going. And even if it's not your first time, there's some good tips from two veterans have gone that have gone to uh, Sundance multiple times. So keep a lookout for that as well. And if you are going to be at Sundance this year, don't forget to visit me. I am actually speaking at Slam Dance up at the top of the hill on Saturday. I think around 1 o'clock. I'll put the actual um, times in the show notes. But uh, we're going to be speaking about two hours. I'm going to have a two-hour lecture on how I put together um, the space program using Black Magic products and uh, how we do This Is Meg and doing the post workflow and the camera workflow all sorts of stuff like that. And we'll also be interviewing uh, the DP uh, extraordinaire from uh, Space Program, Austin Nordell, is going to be there as well. So we're going to be doing a whole bunch of stuff there as well. So please, if you guys are in town, come by, say hi, check it out. Now, today on the show, we have Adam Bowman and Paul Hashlap from Media Circus. These guys are going to be my partners this year uh, at Sundance. We're going to be doing all our interviews and stuff together. But the guy, these guys are insane marketing geniuses that uh, that use that I used on This Is Meg to get the word out uh, on This Is Meg. And uh, what they do is help independent filmmakers get the word out on their films by using social media and all sorts of other marketing strategies. And I wanted to have them on the show to see if they can kind of shine a light on how to really find an audience for your independent film. And these guys have been doing this for a while, and they've seen the the good, the bad, and the ugly in this space. So this episode is full of amazing knowledge bombs in regards to how to find an audience, how to market your film, how to use social media properly, what to do, what not to do on Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube and all the other social media platforms, and how that is not the only thing you can do to get the word out on your film. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Media Circus. I'd like to welcome to the show Adam Bowman and Paul Hashlap. How you doing, brother? We're doing well. How are you, Alex? Good, good. You guys are from Media Circus, who are going to be doing a whole lot of insane stuff over at Sundance this year. So Always. Always, always. And I wanted to bring you guys on to talk about the state of film marketing. Uh, yes, because In- indie film marketing, indie film yeah. marketing, no less. And I think it's something that our audience, uh, my audience specifically, the tribe, you know, loves to hear about because it's one of those mystery things that uh, it's kind of something they don't teach at school and they don't know what to do. And it's a, and it's such an important part of the process. So um, can you talk a little bit, first of all, what is the difference between a PR firm 
and marketing or, or do they overlap? What can we talk about? Like, how does that work? Well, it's so interesting. In, in film, uh, people often just talk about PR. Right. Um, but, you know, I have a, a master's in, in mass communications and marketing. And marketing actually includes all of it. Like, mm-hmm. PR is a piece of marketing. Advertising is a piece of marketing. Um, and a, a really good way to think about it is, you know, advertising is you're telling other people how good your product is. But PR is getting somebody else to tell other people how good your product is. And real, realistically, in, in a perfect marketing uh, ecosystem, you want both of those things to be happening. Mm-hmm. So and that, that's the biggest difference uh, for, for PR is getting other people to advocate for you. And marketing is sort of talking directly to you. So let's talk about <clears throat> when a filmmaker needs PR versus marketing, depending on the size of their project and things like that. Because a lot of filmmakers will just make their movie and there's like, I got to get a PR person. I got to get promote. I got to get the word out on this. And they just have no idea. It's like this shotgun approach Mm -hmm. to getting the word out on it. So when is PR appropriate as far as actually hiring a public relations company? Or when is it just like trying to do more either targeted social media ads or, you know, depending on the project, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. The, (laughs) the, the reality is, uh, scale, I mean, how big your project is, is going to mm-hmm. sort of determine when you want a PR person to come on. Um, there's, depend, depending on what your movie's about, if there's some great hook mm-hmm. in your movie or something that's happening uh, in the production part of the movie, it might make sense to have a publicist uh, come in and do some stuff. I mean, honestly, you should probably have somebody managing the unit publicity of every level of film, even if you're doing a thousand dollar small budget thing, because when you come out for, um, uh, distribution, Mm -hmm. you're going to need stills. You're going to need, uh, those inner, like all the marketing pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, if you didn't have somebody managing that and get, get collecting those through production, uh, then you have very little besides taking screen grabs of the movie itself, uh, to, to put out into the world. Well, I, think, um, I think that is a big mistake that a lot of filmmakers make is they don't understand that you need behind the scene footage. Yeah. You need behind the scene uh, uh, stills. Yeah. Uh, stills that are actually not just screen grabs. Even if you have a nice 4K image, it'd be nice to have an actual professional photographer or someone even with a you know a GH4 or a, a Canon or DSLR to shoot some Absolutely. behind the scenes yeah. stuff. Yeah, and the quality of the images on social media um, over the course of a multitude of images mm-hmm. that you're posting out over a long period of time, a high res, a series of high res images versus a series of lower res screenshots will make some difference so mm-hmm. merely in terms of the reach you get and the, the, you know, sort of, uh, value of those individual pieces. of and, and I think also, and it's something that a lot of filmmakers don't realize is that you're building up kind of like an arsenal of elements yeah. right, to be able to use to market your project. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that they just don't think about. They don't think about behind the scenes footage. They don't think about um, interviews with the cast. They don't think about uh, you know stills, mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff. That when they go to someone like you guys, the first question you're going to ask, like, what do you have? And they're yeah. like, well, we've got a a, 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 a movie. <laughs> yeah, you know. And if they're lucky, you get a trailer. If you're lucky, and right. even then, we could talk about trailers in a minute because that's a whole other conversation. But those those are elements that you guys need to work, right? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. It's not going to hurt you, and uh, like you said, having a good arsenal ready to go of marketing assets mm-hmm. uh, will only serve you down the road. Now, real quick, uh, and this is on a side note, do you think that every film should have its own website? I think that again, it depends on the size of the film, yeah, um, and the amount of resources. But I think that there are many other platforms, social media sites, what have you, that for a lot of films can serve that purpose Mm -hmm. without going through the effort of putting together your own entire separate site. Okay. Um, If you have the resources, large enough film, uh, I think there's value. Um, But well, and for most filmmakers too, they're not really selling anything on a website. Well, that's that's the thing. If if you if you're just selling your movie, I get you. But like if if you like I did for This Is Meg, I created obviously a full website which had behind the scenes footage and all this kind of right. stuff. And it had links to all of the places where people can buy it or rent it or see it. Sure. And it was a place to find out about the cast and about the, so it's, it, it was a little bit more sure. entailed than just a Facebook totally. uh, fan page. Yeah. But it's also very easy for me to go, Oh, just go to this is Yeah. Mm-hmm. So even if you don't do a film, would it be smart to like, let's say your Facebook page is going to be your homepage yeah. of, of, of this movie to buy a URL 
and uh-huh. forward it over to the Facebook page. So you, at least that's an easier sell, an easier thing to market, like, you sure. know, whatever, blah, blah, blah.com. Yeah. Plus, I mean, again, it, it, I don't know that there's a, a hard and fast way. It, okay. And, and scale, right? Mm-hmm. Again, it's scale all scale. Is a huge thing. So, um, in the, in the, the, if you're trying to make a micro budget in the, mm-hmm. um, either money or time is what it's going to take to get that off the ground. And whether that, uh, you're going to see that return on investment from, uh, whether it was time or money mm-hmm. to build a website for that movie. The one thing I would say that might make more sense is building a website for your, your production. Brand, yes. Mm-hmm. Where all of your movies can sort of live. Oh, there. that's a given. Yes. yes. You know, Absolutely. that, that makes more sense. Cause then you can send people to, uh, you know, these are these are my movies. X Y Z Production yeah, right, right, right. Company. Uh, yeah. but but to specifically set up a whole website infrastructure uh, for an, an individual movie, I don't know how valuable that is. Unless you're selling, if you if you are selling other products, other merchandise, and things yeah. like that, and yeah. creating an audience, absolutely, it, it makes perfect you, you, sense. Yeah, totally. You need a place then for the, for people to find uh-huh. that. Yeah. But if you don't have that, if it really all it is is the trailer, a synopsis, and you know pictures of the yeah. cast, you know that kind of lives on IMDb, right? Like, why do you need to? And people are going to be much rather go to IMDb because that's something a website they're familiar with. Yeah, and it's also you got if you're going to create a website, you've got to create value, right? Uh, you yeah, have to create right. something for them to be seeing something. Yeah, that's going to if you're just going for a synopsis, your actors and yeah. that. Yeah, it's not so much. Exactly. But like with Meg, I'll use Meg again as an example. I had a lot of behind the scenes footage. I had videos. Yeah. I had images, uh, and then I also had a place, a hub. Where I can send everybody like, okay, it's on iTunes. I'm here. Here's all the links. Mm-hmm. Here's all the stuff. Uh, and it just made sense for our our. And, and it oh, was yeah. a small budget a, as well. It's, not a, and it's never a wrong choice. Yeah. It's just about it's about budget. I could yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, I could yeah, whip yeah. it up myself, and it didn't right. cost me anything. Right. Yeah. You know. But but exactly. you could also go to Squarespace or something like sure. that and yeah. knock out a website in 30 minutes. Yeah. Right. You know that looks pretty badass. Yeah. And I think another just to echo part of what Adam is saying here, another really important point I, with. Uh, in the indie film world, using any given project you're working on to parallel, you know, to also promote your own filmmaker brand and yourself mm-hmm. at the same time is not only doing two birds with one stone, mm-hmm. but um, a very effective way to do that. And that sort of for the website, mm-hmm. as opposed to having a website for each individual film you make, or even yeah. in some cases a social me- a separate social media presence for each individual film you make, for many filmmakers what makes more sense. And again, it's just a question of size scale is to kind of put all that together into one online presence. And it's, but it's also a question of forethought and playing the long game. Yes. Because a lot of filmmakers, right. If they get their movie made, they're just like, I got a movie made. That's it. They're not thinking about the next two or three movies or even thinking about a production company or thinking about a long-term career. They're just like, I got this movie. I got to promote this thing. Right. And I think filmmakers should think about long-term Playing the long game, totally building up a production company or entity or website like that, well, a brand. If you are just looking at one movie, you're setting yourself up to fail because the right. movie business is a winners pay for losers business. Mm-hmm. You know, can you elaborate on that? So that's why in a, in a production company, even the big studios in, in, or small ones, uh, they try to put out a slate of films, knowing full well that some of them are not going to work. Whether it was the marketing, whether sure. it was the content, whatever it is. Some of them Justice League, Justice League, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. First off, <laughs> we don't know that Justice League isn't working. Look, okay. people can, can I want, critically say it's not working, but financially, it's probably going to be fine. Uh, <laughs> secondly, um, but this is, so the for, idea for winners pay for we, we we go back. And forth. We go we go back and forth on the whole and uh, loves, Marvel DC, and I love that. and I love I love messing mm-hmm. with Adam. Go ahead. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, winners have to pay for losers, and that's the way distribution companies are able to function and stay yep, alive. Absolutely, um, all that. So, um, and from a filmmaker perspective, uh, you cannot put all your eggs in one basket mm-hmm. and, and expect it to financially work out. You might have a whole bunch of other goals uh, for making the movie, whether it's sort of springboarding uh, a career mm-hmm. or uh, creating notoriety, or maybe there's a, a certain message that you really want to get out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are all valuable reasons to make a movie as well, mm-hmm. um, but those ones aren't necessarily sustainable ones. Right, and I think the diversification is yeah. a huge word that filmmakers should understand. Like, you can't just focus only on one project and one thing, right. which is hard because like, getting a movie off the ground is tough. Totally, uh, you know. But to think about it in the long game, to, to keep budgets low, mm-hmm. to do two or three 
smaller movies and and throw those out into the marketplace. Yeah. One might pop, one might not, and keep the budgets low enough that you can kind of recoup. Mm-hmm. But you're right, film you know, distributors in general, like not everyone's a hit. No, not no. at all. And I and, mean, if it was, everybody would have it figured out, right? Like it wouldn't. No, we. There wouldn't be a reason for a podcast about how to market movies or how to make right. movies or how to sell movies. Because everyone's Cause making money. The formula yeah. would have been worked out and everybody would have been said, oh, this is how you do it. Well, You're I mean, done. look at Disney. I mean, look, Disney makes, you know, the arguably probably the most successful uh, studio going on right now mm-hmm. with what they're doing. Bar but none, you, yeah. Bar none. But the thing is, like, you know, they put out, I remember a year or two ago, uh, the Alice in Wonderland sequel mm-hmm. through the Looking Glass. It bombed. Yeah. Like, and that's a $150 million movie, right. you know, or Lone Ranger. John Carter. John Carter. These are massive bombs. Mm-hmm. But out of those massive bombs, they've got like another five or six that made billions of dollars that that help, you know, support the losses. So right, right. that's just the way it is. But it is, you know, now we're getting into another conversation, but like totally. you know, they're getting the bigger, these bigger budgets are risking more and more and more and making fewer and fewer movies. And that model of diversification is not working because they're rolling the dice on a Justice League or on a DC mm-hmm. universe. That is not paying off the way they want it to, sure. you know. And you know, imagine if Harry Potter they threw in, or Lord of the Rings, mm. they spent four hundred fifty million dollars on Lord of the Rings back in the day. Right. They they were rolling the dice on oh, that. Oh yeah, big time. And it, it paid off, but it could have very easily not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so sure. Um, so should um, when should filmmakers start working with uh, you know marketing and thinking about marketing and things like that? You should be thinking about marketing when you think of the idea for the script. Amen, brother. As soon as possible. Amen. Yeah. Preach. Yeah. Um, ideally. And, you know, really what you should do is go see what's trending in social media and write a script based on that. <laughs> um, because then you know there's a there's a built-in audience a niche audience so, but let's no know. no hold on that's a very good point yeah and i'm gonna i'm gonna bring i want to stop you there because it's something that filmmakers don't get they just they, they sit in their bubble and they'll come up with an idea and they'll go i'm gonna make this movie not thinking about who it's for how they're gonna get it out there and if you write something that's based on an existing and, and we're talking about the micro budget mm-hmm. but even in the on the macro budget sure world we're talking the studio world that's what they're doing Mm -hmm. when they put out justice league they they hope that the the fan base for those characters are there and they they're making a movie for that fan base as well as as broad of an audience as humanly possible yeah um but for micro budgets if you can come up with an idea that you can and i'll use the same thing the vegan chef movie (laughs) the vegan chef movie i mean if i came to you guys with a movie Oh, so it's a romantic comedy about a vegan chef who falls in love with a meat eater, you yeah. know, <laughs> and that's the story. Mm-hmm. And, then, and I go, oh, by the way, I also have 15 courses on how to make vegan, you know, pastries or whatever. And I'm bringing this to you guys. You'd be like, yes, you, you'd be like salivating. Yeah. Because you could market that easily, right, Paul? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's perfect. Because it's like you said, I mean, the, it, it's a movie that appeals to known existing fan bases of people or demographics of people who have a certain kind of interest mm-hmm. that are relatively easy to target, especially on social media. Right. Um, so you can connect those two dots very easily. Um, and there you go. You have an audience right yep. there built in. Yeah. Now there was the, there was a success story that you guys were talking about, uh, the dog fighting movie. Can you talk a little bit about what happened with that project? And cause it just goes along with what we're talking about. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there, yeah, we're, uh, working with this movie, uh, chance. And, uh, what's great about it is, these people had uh, what they felt was a calling to tell a story about um, sort of the the darkness, the the the, um, the negative thing that is dog fighting. We of all know is it's horrible. You know, right. It's horrible, um, but it still happens. Oh, every day. And you know they they also recognized that like they didn't want to do you know a real real dog movie with dog fighting. So they decided to make a CG movie about dog fighting from the dog's perspective. Um, and it, you know, it's really powerful, really emotional, but I think what, what the success part was we started, uh, the social media management for them and a lot of their content without, you know, doing the big boosting budgets and stuff like that, that everybody else is saying you have to do now went viral. I mean, everybody talks about the word viral, like they want their stuff to go viral. Yeah. This viral is not really something you can uh, create say um but this literally did go viral i mean it went Paul, you probably have the, the numbers uh, yeah. off the top of your head better than i do right now yeah so i mean it's the the, tra- the trailer has been viewed over a million times on facebook mm-hmm. 
Um, and the full reach is something like 3.5 million. Um, for an indie movie. For a tiny indie movie, and this is with zero paid boosting applied to that. And, and you, your yes. listeners may, from the previous episode, know all about Facebook and sure, Facebook sure, sure, boosting sure. and stuff. This is completely organic. So, in, in which in the modern day of Facebook is That's unheard of. even more insane. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that didn't happen right away. No. Um, essentially, you know, so this is a, a great example of a film that has, and the filmmakers, by the way, uh, ironically, I mean, they made the film for the same reason out of passion mm-hmm. for this subject, mm-hmm. a genuine passion. They really care very much about this. So mm-hmm. they made this movie actually for the same reason. Probably most filmmakers make their movie right. and now, not with you. any, yeah, not with any forethought about marketing or anything, mm-hmm. but it turned into sort of a, um, happy accident that, um, this, uh, film and its content found relatively quickly a very passionate fan base on social media. So we first started releasing content. So, I mean, for, for us, when they brought us the project, the strategy was, was pretty obvious. You mm-hmm. know, we, we want to create content, obviously that represents the film, um, but that also talks about this subject and hopefully educates people about this horrendous practice and right. what they might be able to do to help put a stop to this or to mm-hmm. rescue dogs in need of rescue or to support organizations that help, you know, rescue, adopt yeah. animals and all of that. The strategy really was built around the idea that uh, social media is social people talk and, and it's conversation. And this yeah. movie had its topic that they could be part of the conversation. It wasn't just watch our movie, watch our movie, watch our movie. Right. It was, yeah. uh, you know, uh, this is a, a topic that people are talking about, you know, dog rescue, dog euthanasia, um, euthanizing, not euthanasia, euthanizing. Um, and uh, yeah. And also so on the flip side, all the organizations that are there to be supported that are working so hard sure. to rescue these animals and, yeah. and, and to combat this this practice and this stuff. And did that turn into all those views turn into sales or rentals? It's well, not even out yet. So you're just still building the audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the audience is just rapidly waiting yes. for, no pun intended, uh, rapidly mm-hmm. waiting for um, for the film to come out. Yeah. Well, that's been, that being a big point up that a lot of filmmakers think that they only should start building an audience when they have a product to sell. Mm. What do you, what's your point yeah. on that? Well, and we, we've talked about this before, but the, the building an audience and creating awareness uh, is like anything else you're going to do in life. And in, in, in particular with filmmaking, there's the uh, adage that, you know, you, there's three things your movie can be. It can be good, it can be fast, it can be cheap, but it can only be two of those things. Mm-hmm. Building an audience is the exact same thing. You can build a really good, engaged audience, and you can do it fast, but it's not going to be cheap. You, if you want to do it, build a good, engaged audience and do it cheap, you've got to do it over time. Um, and the other thing, you know, you look at you know, really big movies, uh, Justice League, for example, <laughs> um, you know, they, they oh, create God. a lot of awareness God, they because money. they put a ton of money oh. into making sure it's everywhere. I mean, we're, here in L.A., you could not no. breathe without seeing a Justice no. League poster somewhere. Sure. Now, for a small indie film right. um, to reach market saturation of everybody being aware of their movie, uh, they either need to start that very early or they're just going to keep doing it forever. In fact, they probably should do it forever yeah. because – they're never going to reach that point that, of like everybody knowing about it. The reality, without, yeah, yeah, without either spending a whole bunch of money or just taking that time, right? And, and and again, and how do you? So when you're building that audience, though, how do you keep them engaged all this time while they're waiting for the final product? Are you putting out behind the scenes? Are you doing interviews? Are you talking to your audience? How, you know, how is that? It working? depends on the movie. Okay, you know, for yeah. for, for chance, like I was saying, it it it's. Uh, a perfect topic to be inserted into a conversation that's already happening right. in social media, which is why I went back to that. Like, if you really want to make a movie that sells, find conversations in social media, niche audiences that your movie can be inserted into and be part of that, that world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one thing that also will do to you, to your question about how do you keep all that going? Where's the content? How do you keep this momentum going? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it, over a prolonged period of time, um, depending on what the needs are in, in terms of release and, and time to finish the project. Um, when you do, if you attach yourself to a larger conversation, then you open yourself up to all this content you can share right. that isn't directly about your film, but maybe it's articles about this subject or other content from other people who are also talking about from this. From an subject. account that is about the movie. No. 
Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Posting it from an from, account. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Posting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is all content for your account. Right. So all of yeah. a sudden people start subscribing or following right. your account because right. – they are interested in what your content you're providing, whether it's your own content or, re- right. or repurposing other people's content. You're you're making a connection with an audience. Right. Yes, member. and at the very least, you're you're sustaining the interest of whatever audience you have captured. And I, and the, I'll use yeah. a perfect example with what I do with Indie Film Hustle. When I first started with Indie Film Hustle, I didn't have a lot of content, right. so I just repurposed other people's YouTube videos mm-hmm. or memes or yeah. inspiration mm-hmm. or whatever. I did that for months before I started being, and then of course inserting my my content. Yeah. But then slowly to a point where now I have more than enough content to, to go around, yeah. then now I just use that. But that's how I was able to use it. And I still repurpose totally. other people's stuff totally. yeah, as well because it's part of providing value to my audience, yeah. whether that be talking about uh, a, co- a very passionate subject that they want yeah. uh, or finding more information about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a perfect way to start uh, your page to begin with. Mm-hmm. Like if you've got a film and you want to start your social media at this inception of the idea before you've even read the script, you know, you know what the genre is. You'll know what the – hopefully – you know what the genre is, you know what the hook is, you know what the, the theme of the movie is, and you know you can find those conversations online and be, be part of those uh, from the beginning. There's a buddy of mine who, just for fun, opened up a Facebook page. He has wiener dogs, mm-hmm. and he opened up a wiener dog page. And he just started putting up funny, because there's a lot of funny wiener there's dog. Ton. There's yeah. a lot of funny wiener dog stuff out yeah. there. And he just started posting it, and he's yeah. like got like a hundred thousand followers now. Yeah. And now what he does is he posts like products for wiener sure. dogs, and yeah. now he makes a living. Yep. Pulling totally. all that kind of stuff out. But I was we were interesting because there was a movie called Wiener Dog. You remember that one from Noah Bachman? Um, I don't remember that, but it, it was a, a movie called Wiener Dog, and I was like, how perfect of a marketing situation mm-hmm. is a movie called Wiener Dog? You've yeah. got a built-in audience yep. that it might be small, but passionate. I, I would yeah. argue that that breed in particular, Dachshunds. Uh, would not be a small audience. Anytime I go somewhere, yeah. so my my uh, my in laws own dachshunds and they love dachshunds. And so anytime we go somewhere, I, I guarantee whether it's a department store, oh no, or, or a strip, you can always find some sort of kitsch with dachshunds on it. Mm. Right. Not every that's not you know another breed, breed that's coming yeah, up. Dachshunds always another yeah. breed that's coming up is the corgis. Oh yeah, I have. A, I used to have a corgi, and I was before it was in vogue. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. They're everywhere. Yeah. Sorry, we're going off a tangent, guys. Well, <laughs> to some extent, however, I mean, uh, th- we might have opened up a whole new category of ways of thinking about. Mo- I mean, pick yeah. a breed of dog and make a movie about it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Find, find the breed of dog that has not yet been represented on film, and that's well, their. But your, generally their speaking, niche. dog movies do well. Right. Yes. There's right. a fam- They're generally family. Sure. You're gonna. You put a dog on a cover. Yeah. yeah. That's why there's 45 Air Buds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Air Bud saves Christmas. Totally. I mean, they, they, they but I wonder, yeah, yeah. like, to Paul's point that I, I might disagree with a little bit, if you pick a breed that nobody's heard of, like you pick a, it, a, 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 a Borzoi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, know what that is. Nobody it, knows what that is. That's why Air Bud is a golden retriever. It's yeah. like one of the most popular dogs there are, right? right? For sure. Um, but, but has a dachshund been yes. star of a movie? Wiener Dog. Okay. <laughs> the movie called Wiener Dog. Man, Remember the conversation maybe, we just had? Yes, no, no, no. <laughs> Children, do not, kids, do not do drugs. <laughs> it's not good. But there, oh. there, might be, there might be more room for more than one Wiener Dog movie. Oh, if, there's 40, if there's 45 Air yeah, Buds. There's, there's not, there's you know, not a, a, a – If there's Wiener a, Dog is the sole <laughs> Dachshund yeah. film, there might be room for – Another Dotson more. film? Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah right. I, so, I don't think there's a saturation of Dotson movies yeah. out there. Well, there That's you true. go. There's probably there not there a saturation go. of Air Bud movies yet either. That might also be true. You know what? Yeah. They, they, they literally got like I, – I was I was clicking through Netflix mm-hmm. and I saw like Air Bud Saves Christmas. I was like, you got to be <laughs> kidding me. But but is there an Air Bud Saves Kwanzaa? No, yeah. There you go. I, I mean I think there's room. I yep. think there's room That's for everything. <laughs> Now, Paul, can we talk a little bit about some um, marketing concepts and ideas that are outdated? Sure. Because there's so many people that think five years ago, what worked five years ago is working right now, sure. or it's going to work in a year when your movie comes out. Right. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing that I encounter with people, uh, with clients and, and, and people who are trying to market any product, service, or films in particular on social media is that they have this sense that social media has a, is a little bit of magic. <laughs> you put something out there right. and it, it's going to kind of, and they have these notions about viralness and, mm-hmm. and how this stuff works. Trending. And not, yeah. And, oh, and trending. putting something out there in, on social media, literally just posting something on social media 
will allow, give it the, it's this opportunity for it to sort of magically find its way to some sort of audience and potentially money <laughs> reach a ton of people. Sure. And while Which that's not impossible, money, yeah. it's become harder and harder and harder and harder and harder over the years oh, God, yes. merely because of saturation. Absolutely. Saturation of the social media landscape. Mm-hmm. There's just way more content out there than there was five, ten years ago. Oh, and what you need to do now is it, it's you essentially you can no longer just put something out there and it will have a good chance of reaching the people who are likely to be interested in the content you're putting out there. Mm -hmm. You have to work for their attention. Job number one, before anything that people, this is the step that people skip in my opinion, or or at least in terms of their understanding Mm -hmm. of, of what they're trying to accomplish is they think that they'll be able to, they know the audience they want to reach. They may have identified it. They know what, how they want to represent and brand their movie. Mm, I, w- I would go so far as to say, I don't know that even they've, they've figured that part In, in many cases, they haven't. Right. But let's say best case scenario, sure, they, best they case. have. They, and they, they think that they'll be able to put it out there and that by some sort of social media osmosis, right. <laughs> that, that content will start to reach those people without any additional work. And, and that I think has changed dramatically. You need to work for those people's Mm -hmm. attention. And when you say work at the end of the day, it's providing a value to them in one way, shape or form, entertainment, Mm -hmm. information, passion. But that's what you mean by work. Like you're, 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 you're connecting with them in one way, shape or form. And that's definitely a part of it. Mm -hmm. But even that I Mm -hmm. think is no longer enough in and of itself. You definitely want to provide value. Mm -hmm. You must Mm -hmm. provide value. If you're not, nobody's going to pay attention. You're just wasting your time. Um, so for sure, like, and that would fall into the sort of, you know, category of content strategy. What are we putting out? Why is it of value to our target demographic? Maybe it's content from the film that we just think is going to be entertained to them. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And that can work great. Um, or maybe it's attaching yourself to a larger conversation and providing Mm -hmm. information about that subject, that conversation, Mm -hmm. et cetera, like Mm -hmm. we just talked about with the dog movie. Um, but, uh, essentially beyond that, you have to play the social media game and get ahead of, you know, rise above sort of the giant, you know, saturation of all these different voices, all these different pieces of content, trying and competing for everyone's attention. And there are various ways to do that. And essentially it's, you know, uh, different tactics for how you actually approach posting uh, where you're putting your content, when you're posting, hashtags, using the paid boosting options, all of these little details of how to properly use social media or how to properly target a very specific audience beyond just the type of content you're putting out. All of those things matter and make a mm-hmm. difference and can put you ahead of the other people competing for those same eyeballs. Yeah. And that's much become much more important, I feel. Now... Would you agree that video is the number one piece of content that you can use? Not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. It depends on the platform. Okay. Video is very strong on Facebook right, right now. Um, Twitter, not so much. Twitter, it is. I would say more notably, Instagram is where, in my experience, image can still outperform video dramatically. Yes, I, I would agree, yes. Um, which isn't to say you shouldn't be putting video on Instagram and that video mm-hmm. can't do very well on Instagram. But Instagram is still the home of the static image. Yes, um, in my opinion, it's the basis of the entire platform. Yes, right. Yeah, um, but and, fa- but in Facebook, I mean, I, as I scroll, yeah. I, I rarely stop for an image unless it's sure. something really interesting. Sure, video is all I see now. It's sure, just like video, 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 video. A video, couple video. Uh, an important things to note about that. Mm-hmm. This is how obviously it's very natural to develop an opinion about how Facebook is working based on your own personal experience of Facebook. Right, because it's but yeah. A couple of things about that. Yeah, First of all, right. small sample size, obviously. Sure. Second of all, Facebook is tailoring your personal Facebook feed based on your personal behavior. So what's showing up in your Facebook feed may be dramatically different than what is showing up in someone else's Facebook feed, even if, for example, you <laughs> and some other person followed all of the same people. My, my habits are different. Your right. habits are different. <laughs> right. And so the algorithm is going to serve you a different kind of content. So that's not to say that video isn't the leader on right. Facebook right now. It's very strong on Facebook. Right. But if you, um, and as a filmmaker, it may be the case that mm-hmm. you are gravitate towards video and you're interacting more with video, mm-hmm. Facebook is going to serve you personally 
more video. video. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the experience anyone else is having. So that's just an important thing to bear in mind mm -hmm. um, when it comes to social media. It, it's with the algorithms and the way content is served to people. It's so personalized now that I, I think it's very important to avoid the, the trap of yeah. The gen generalization is based on your very very specific feed. If you guys had money right now, where are you going to spend it on? Which social media platform is the number one for for a movie right now? In your opinion, if uh, you're going to spend how much like money, a, and what's the budget of the film? Because because again, it's all scale, right? But but if it's all scale, regardless though, even if you had a million dollars or a thousand dollars, there is a platform that you would probably focus on more than you would on others. And you're talking about like a paid ad spend, paid ad spend, yeah. yes, Facebook ads. Facebook. Oh, yeah. I, I don't, I, Without I, question, it's the most powerful. Without oh, yeah. question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Twitter, don't waste your time. YouTube with, ads. With, with ad yeah. spend, part of it, I would agree with that on, on Twitter. But I also, I wouldn't write Twitter off as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a platform that you shouldn't be using. Um, oh, no, no, no. But for, for spending money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For spending money, I, I've, yeah. I've never spent a dime on Twitter. And I, and I get a lot of, from Twitter. It's one of my biggest you know, yeah. social media platforms. And mm -hmm. I connect with a lot of filmmakers, you know, a lot of my audience there. But it's like I yeah. would never – I never hear of anyone going, I did this boost on Twitter and yeah. I, I – just no, it doesn't work that yeah. way. I have spent money on Twitter for that, clients. So and, you're the one. And, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, and That's why Twitter reported and, that big boost uh, and, last quarter in, in yeah, earnings. The, yeah, yeah but, it's just because but, of Paul. <laughs> my, but my experience is consistent with that. I mean uh – -huh. Which is? The Facebook – the opportunities on Facebook are much stronger. Um, they, just, for, for paid, they could target for yes. yeah. the tar but yeah, and here's but here's the thing about Facebook. Uh, I, I I stress Facebook because it only if you know how to use it. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. If you don't know how to use it, You're it can done. be a giant waste of money. Oops. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so you uh, um, you know you have to you have to understand the process of matching the content you're creating and putting out to the proper available targets yes. that Facebook gives you and they have amazing targets, but you can't necessarily, first of all, you can't necessarily target anything. And you also have to be mindful of what you're targeting when you're targeting by interests on Facebook. Okay. Obviously you can also do age and all this other stuff. Sure. But, um, for example, uh, you know, say you want to, uh, target, uh, say you're selling soccer balls and mm -hmm. you say, well, I want to target people who play soccer. Well, you can't target people who play soccer mm -hmm. on Facebook. That's not an available Target. Soccer is an interest. Soccer is an interest. You can target people who follow, uh, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo. Sure. Or uh, who? But how many of those guys are going to buy a soccer ball right you, now? Well, that's and that's the, those are the questions you need to start to ask. So, so the targeting is vast and amazing, but you also want to understand the nuances of what you're actually targeting. Right. Specific products are interesting, like something like that. Sure. Like a Star Wars cup. Very easy. Anybody who's into exactly. Star Wars, you can go That's after a Star no Wars. Right. Yeah. Again, vegan chef. People yeah. who are interested in vegans, you know, yep. in that kind of food, you know, whatever, yeah. easy to easy to target. Yeah. But like a soccer ball, mm -hmm. which is a very broad spectrum yeah. product. Right. It's hard to, to pinpoint that. Yeah. A football, a baseball. Sure. You know, a water bottle. Like, mm -hmm. like perfect. A, a water bottle that keeps your, your water cold for yeah. three days. Uh -huh. You can hit hikers. You can mm -hmm. hit sure. workout. But you're not going to go – Who's interested in buying a water bottle right now? Yeah, because sure. water Harder. bottle is not an interest on here. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. But hiking is, yoga mm -hmm. is, sure. other places that people do exercise. Sure. Yeah. And to take it back to film, I mean, the same can be true for certain kinds of films. Sure. To take the opposite example of a film that has a real specific great hook, mm -hmm. say it's just, you know, like this is kind of general, but just a broad it's an action comedy movie. or a broad or an comedy. action movie. Sure. Much harder to target a super, specific audience. Super difficult. It's not that you can't find, and, and that's where you got to rely more heavily on. on Good content, or you know, really, and also like if you have an action movie that has a certain star in it, you could you could target yes, other other movies exactly of that star. That would be a form of a hook, and I, even I that would star yeah. might even be an interest. Oh, of course, exactly. that's a, but even yeah. if you have a broad spectrum uh, action movie that has no stars in it, yes. but it's kind of like Lethal Weapon, you could target people who like Lethal yes, Weapons or you can. or uh, Rush Hour or those kind of yep. things. But again, you're you're shooting pretty much. You're throwing stuff up on the on the on the it, wall. That's still a big target. It's extremely. Yeah. You're just yeah, kind of exactly. like it's that's, not super pinpoint. Yep, exactly. Um. So, and that's what filmmakers need to understand. Like, if you're going to go after marketing on Facebook, something like that. Yes. You know, you have to have a hook, a, something that could connect. Yeah. But that that perfect example is like if you know if you like Lethal Weapon, you'll like my movie. Mm -hmm. That's so and broad, but yeah, targeted, is. but broad. Sure. And that can, that can work. Uh, we yeah. have a client uh, we're working with right now 
um, where, um, and, and again, it's pretty broad comedy. Um, it does have some specific hooks, but um, essentially we are targeting audiences very similar to what you're describing, mm -hmm. related broad comedies, similar mm -hmm. types of films and the sure. audiences who like those. Right. And, um, and we're creating some fun, funny content that represents the content of the film, but mm -hmm. we also think it's shareable and funny and getting, hopefully getting laughs out of people. And that's performing really well, mm -hmm. um, really strongly. Mm -hmm. So it's not, not to discourage people from using Facebook to market a film that is, is less, right. you know, le has that less specific hook. Uh, but it, it, if that's the case, um, you better have some, some funny content. Some well, that's content. the key, isn't it? It's like, yeah. you gotta have, a, you have a content strategy Yeah, with, mm -hmm. with that. You're not just throwing yeah. up a trailer or, you know, a poster and exactly. hoping for the best. You've got a content strategy aiming yep. at these kind of people. Exactly. Right? And, 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 and it's a long-term game. You can't expect, you know, like you have three really good posts and you just put them up there. Yeah. And they expect that that's what's going to yeah. uh, drive sales. Let's say the movie's out and, and, you know, you have those three good posts. The chances of somebody, you know, seeing that post the first time and clicking on it and going to iTunes or Amazon or, or wherever to buy the movie is so, so small. I mean, typically in, in, in marketing, you need like 11 touch points mm -hmm. before somebody. Can you like, explain a touch point? <clears throat> some sort of interaction. So like for, for a film perspective. Uh, one of the reasons Justice League and, and all the big studios do the like great big mass uh, marketing where you're seeing billboards, you're seeing bus ads, you're seeing Facebook posts, you're seeing trailers on television, you're seeing, uh, you know, uh, the action toy in your McDonald's Happy Meal. You're seeing all those things because you, the people, people need to like experience that content 11 times at least before they're like, you know what? I've heard of this. I know what this is, and now I'm going to buy it. You know, it's funny that, uh, and I watch my daughters now because which, we're in LA, so LA is. I mean, when I have friends come in from out of town, they're like, "You've got movie posters everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there's all it is is movie app, uh, uh, marketing." Right. So now, uh, right. recently, Paddington Two is coming <laughs> out, and they start. <clears throat> and it's funny because we drive around and they'll see the bus ads mm -hmm. or they'll see a billboard. And now they started to bring up Paddington, like, hey, daddy, when is Paddington coming out? So I found it so interesting, like even on a six-year-old's mm -hmm. mind, they're seeing it because it's something directed at them. Mm -hmm. They want it. And, and it's so powerful. It is such a powerful thing that a six-year-old totally. can be, you know, like Coco, God forbid. Coco is like the biggest thing since sliced bread sure. with my girls, yeah. uh, which is it's arguably my favorite film of the year. Um, and it's amazing. But when Coco was out, like at Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. you couldn't walk anywhere no. in, in Burbank, let alone anywhere else that you could not see a Coco poster. Yep. And they were on us. Like, when is Coco? We want to see Coco. We, you know, and we show them a trailer or something like that. So it's really interesting that you're right. Those, those touch points and not that just one poster, they see it again and again right. and again until right. they finally say yeah. something had they seen one poster they would not have been asking when does coco come out right you know right. it takes it takes it's like your subconsciously your brain needs to process it over and over and then it's like oh this is a thing it's it's like you've you built this uh item in your head of like i know what this is and oh. now i want to buy it well perfect example star wars last jedi yeah. i mean my girls because they, they watched like disney channel and of course there's a couple ads that, so they were the ones bringing up like, oh, when are you, you going to go see Last Jedi, Dad? I'm like, what the hell? Like, I haven't shown you anything about Last Jedi. And it's, you just and, turn to him and you high five. And I high five. <laughs> obviously, high five. But like, when can we see it? I'm like, you're not seeing it anytime soon. So <laughs> it's a <laughs> little too much for you just yet. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, out there. So can, also, I wanted to ask you guys, in, in the scope of marketing as a general statement, what are the, the, the categories or sections of things that – we should think about. So there's PR, mm -hmm. um, there is social media marketing, which is a whole beast on its own. And those are really two different, I mean, within social media, I think there's two things, yeah. right? Because there's the organic, uh, audience building sure. part of it. And then there's the sort of paid advertising boosting part of it. And those are the, even though the content's similar, the strategies are slightly different right. because, um, a lot of social media is almost like PR because what you want to do is insert yourself in those conversations mm -hmm. and get other people to talk about you. So, you know, when people share mm -hmm. or people like, that's really a PR move, right? That's other, let them letting other people know that 
they like or sharing your stuff. So it's it's a really interesting uh, blend of, of those two sort of advertising and PR. Now, with, sorry, can, and, and then right, ones, right. Yeah. So so there's the social media. There's PR meaning, and I would say PR is uh, public relations, publicists, public, pub, pub, yeah, publicists, publicists, um, and things like that. Reviews and, and reviews, and, uh, interviews, editorials, editorials, and, right. and things like that. Like I'm, you know, we're things getting going to show up in regular media that people think of as, as media. Right. I get I get hit up all the time by PR people and publicists about trying to get people on the show. Yeah. Uh, and now we're going to Sundance and we're getting hit up by the, the Sundance filmmakers uh, who want to be on the show and, mm-hmm. and, and do all that kind of stuff as well. So there is a value there, and it's a, that, that's a real specific thing. So, like, if you have a film in Sundance, you should probably hire a publicist or someone who handled that kind of to get you into because you, yeah. you've got heat on you. Right. If you got into Sundance, the iron is hot. You the need to iron is hot. You should spend money. You get in South by Southwest, you get into Tribeca, you get in one of these major festivals, mm-hmm. you should probably hire a publicist or someone who can get you. When I say someone, someone like you guys. Who can make those calls, reach out to their contacts, and get them on in, into print, into interview shows, mm-hmm. into podcasts, or stuff like that? Totally. But the other, I think the other part of it is, uh, it used to be you could just have publicists, right? And, and I'm not. This is not to knock publicists at all. I think it's a, a very uh, key element of the marketing mm-hmm. equation. Uh, but again, if you're not, if you don't have control of your own social media, and you're not uh, able to start sharing that content that you're collecting from publicists. So if you have an interview with somebody, if you get an editorial in uh, the Hollywood reporter, mm-hmm. you know, it's, that's awesome. It's great. But it doesn't mean a whole lot because it, unless you're also pushing it out to people to let them know that that exists for them to read and, and that it's a big deal, right? Right. You're, you're, you're trying to extend the audience that's reading or enjoying that right. content. Because again, the Hollywood reporter and, you know, we, we were with another client, um, whose film was coming out and they got this review in the Hollywood reporter and it was a, you know, for a sm- very small micro budget indie film, uh, getting an, uh, an article in the Hollywood reporter is huge. It's a huge deal. And then when the movie came out, there were like zero sales right out, right off the bat, right behind this Hollywood reporter thing. So it's not like people are just reading the Hollywood reporter like it's a newspaper. Yeah, who's and reading it though? Who's reading the Hollywood the Reporter? Thing, right? You're yeah. talking about industry. Industry people are reading the Hollywood Reporter. And industry doesn't buy movies. <laughs> no, no. Um, but Hollywood Reporter is, is a publication that other people or just movie audiences have heard of. But they don't, it's not a... They're, they're, but, right, but for you, but it's, it's about creating the, uh, the world of your movie in terms of, you know, you don't just have a Facebook page, but you also have these reviews out in the world. Excuse me. So when somebody is thinking about what movie to buy, and they're like, "Oh, I've heard of this." Again, it's touch points, right? There's you have these places where information about your movie lives, and you you could then need to share it even farther so that there's more people know that this is a thing. Like this movie is a thing. It's not just one of thousands of movies that got put online yesterday. Mm-hmm. This movie has some heat behind it, or this movie. Oh, I've heard about mm-hmm. that. You know, it's credibility. Some other, it, it's credibility, but it's also a way that they've at least heard about it. So mm-hmm. it's not like they're just seeing it for the first time on their iTunes uh, while they're scrolling through and and having to choose between all those movies that are there. They're like, I've actually heard about this one. Well, it's also the ch- the challenge of channeling all of these other pieces of content and exposures and touch points mm-hmm. through an audience that right. you're hopefully creating. Yeah. Which is what like we did with this is Meg. When we got a review, we'd pump it through all of our social media outlets. And yep. so it's a way to people go, hey, this is what's going on over there. We got a review at Hollywood Reporter or Variety or something like that. But if you just sit on the Hollywood Reporter, like, oh, that's the it, that might have been it in 86. Mm-hmm. That's not the way it is now. No. Right, Paul? Yeah. And and again, to speak to some uh, speaking of things that are somewhat outdated, um, or at least in this, you know, time period things. Print, print magazines? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean I think that there is, and and not to point to anything specific, because again, it can it can vary depending on individual project mm-hmm. and, and who you're trying to reach. But I think there are a lot of more traditional concepts that filmmakers have about what is promotional prestige, yeah. whether yes. that be a premiere or a billboard or uh, being in a, a certain certain theaters, whatever it may be. Which traditionally, like you said, back in '86, back whenever it was. 
that was 100% the way to do it. Sure. That was the only way to go. And that's the only really avenue for getting in front of people. Um, ideas they have about where the prestige, where creating prestige and credibility and awareness of their film happens versus where that's happening in this day and age. Mm -hmm. um, and to what extent some of those previous practices may have eroded in their, in their value. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether that's something like, uh, again, it, it depends on the film. So it's not necessarily the case for each film, but, uh, Hollywood reporter article in Hollywood reporter. What does that mean in this day and age? Who's reading to that? film sales? Yeah. To film sales. Right. How, you know what it, how does that, it has, it has a certain cachet. Oh, um, absolutely. But, it has. Yeah. But, and again, uh, it depends on the, on the goals of the filmmaker yeah. and, and you know, about what it was in making that film. Again, yeah. it's well, the springboard, the career. Yeah, those are good places to sure. have your name show up. Absolutely. I mean, look, in 2005, I was lucky enough to get Roger Ebert to review my short film. Right. Mm -hmm. That turned into sales. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. That turned into sales totally. because it was such an obscene, obscure thing, a short film to have a review yeah. from Roger Ebert that it caused a, a, you know, a, a, a phenomenon within yep. the indie film world because yep. they're like, who the hell are these guys? Yeah. Right. You know, what the hell is this? And, and it just, and then I had a product to sell and it just all worked out. Yeah. So there was a tremendous amount of prestige, which I still you know, carry around. I'm like, yeah, I got Roger. Totally. It's something I'll always have like, Hey, I had Roger Ebert review one of my Absolutely. short films. It's amazing. Um, now the one thing I want to talk about as well is ROI mm -hmm. with marketing and with PR and all of that stuff, because a lot of times filmmakers will, you know, let's say we got 10,000 bucks and we dump in 10,000 bucks into marketing. Mm -hmm. Well, the point of marketing is to make sales. Um, hopefully if that's what the, the end, if it's just to get audience or whatever, that's another company. Let's say for the state of argument, it's about turning it into sales. Mm -hmm. Um, filmmakers really need to understand about ROI. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is, you know, it, and it's so hard. That's what, that's been the struggle with marketing in general since the beginning of time. Mm, right. Like how much money am I putting in? How can I register sales? And nowadays you can actually see real time data of people clicking, who's buying, who's not buying, if it's a digital uh, product. Well, the, yes. And the, the tough thing with the, with that uh, streamline though, is that, you know, you can, you can drive people to click on your iTunes link. Sure. What you can't tell because iTunes doesn't give you that information is, uh, did they buy? Did they buy from that? Link? Right. All you can do is track that, track how many people clicked on the link and then compare that with how many people actually bought the movie. Right. And you don't know where those sales are coming from. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, there, again, you don't have that uh, quantifiable data, but on some level, you have to recognize that if nobody knew about your movie, mm -hmm. nobody's going to buy it. Right. No, absolutely. And there's also, there's another thing too, like let's say perfect example, uh, my film gets into Sundance. Yeah. And I go, you know what, guys, I'm going to give you guys 10 grand. I want you to blow my name and this movie's name everywhere mm -hmm. i don't it's not about making money it's about exposure and everyone's yeah. hearing about who i am right. as a filmmaker and my brand and also about this movie that got into sundance and that's the end goal mm -hmm. that i think is extremely valuable because that totally. turns into money in the long oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Long, because what's a perfect example something like that i didn't let's say i don't sell any money you know my movie's yeah. a sh little indie sure you know really obscure movie um but all that press gets me an agent that hires me to rewrite a script or all of a sudden it turns out. So you have to look at it on that standpoint totally. as well. Totally. And, and right. the return doesn't always necessarily mean straight up dollar value. Correct. Right? I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, return on investment can mean. Yeah. And what are the other things? So people, well, like saying, you were just saying, yeah. um, you know, there's uh, trying to grow your career awareness, right? uh, awareness about yourself and your brand. Um, it, again, it could be if you're, if the uh, subject matter of the movie you're, made is something that you care about people talking about, like the, the chance movie, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to help stop dog fighting and create awareness about it, um, that the return could be more people talking about that subject matter, um, and, and a voice for change. So the return could be any number of things that has, uh, intrinsic value to you, not specifically dollar value. Yeah. No. Oh, and yeah, and also just the, the long-term development of your filmmaker right, brand, your right. production company brand, mm -hmm. uh, which can translate down the line into, mm -hmm. into more money, more sales for future projects. Absolutely. So, yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about, which is press releases. Mm -hmm. 
it is a, it, it, in my opinion, it's, there's still value there to a certain extent. But before, like you were saying, in 86, that was it. Mm-hmm. Press release, billboards, that was how you got out. Um, press releases are expensive if done right, even if you use PR web, mm-hmm. which a lot of people use PR web, and you can boost it up to as fucking you know, whatever. Um, but I personally, in today's world, don't find a lot of value in PR, and, excuse me, in press releases, if they are um, if they're done for like low budget movies and stuff like that. I find it's a waste of money. But on a bigger budget, well, bigger movies maybe. But I want to hear your opinion. I agree. I think doing uh, like creating a press release and just going out to PR web is probably uh, not a very valuable prospect. Um, I, I was listening to this marketing podcast this morning, and they were talking about uh, you know they do email marketing, and, and of course email. You know, there's some value in email, but it's not the end all be all. And in fact, just like uh, direct mail, your open rates are are much lower. But um, they started reaching out through Twitter and Twitter messaging people, and they were getting almost a hundred percent response rate when they did that. Um, so, just going through a a like cold call PR web press release avenue, I, I agree, is probably not a very valuable... Unless there's a hook. Even then, I, I, I still think the value of a publicist in, in working on this, something like that is they're going to send that press release to the right places and they're right. going to have a relationship with right. the people because yeah. uh, they know that that person is going to respond to this content and, and know that the hook is the right thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and rather than the, just the, the cold call uh, blast of um, your press release going to all these media outlets through PR web, I mean, that's you're playing a numbers game at that point, but it's you're not really getting it to the right. There's no analytics to know that you're getting it to the right places. That's that, the thing is like yeah. you're just basically just throwing money yeah, out there yeah, and yeah. and hoping for the best, which is like when you buy a print ad, mm-hmm. yeah. it, it, you know, nowadays as opposed to you know why would anyone spend five thousand dollars on a, a full page ad in you know Variety versus for a film versus spending that five thousand dollars on targeted ads? Yeah, of of People who work in the industry in the same right. exact way, but you can actually quantify and see the stats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I do think that it, in terms of press releases, it, you sh- it should be taken into consideration. To what extent does your film have a story that can be right. told about right. it, mm-hmm. and how, what kind of legs does that story have? Right. Um, and if it, the answer is some big legs, well, then you might want to consider that. Well, like you well, was, uh, defining big legs is also tough within filmmakers. Sure. Well, like sure. I was, so we were talking before the show started of uh, that Jake the Snake documentary. <laughs> yeah. So that Jake the Snake documentary, um, I forgot. What it was, I think it was called the Jake the Snake documentary. I forgot yeah. what it's called. <laughs> um, if for people who don't know who Jake the Snake was, Jake the Snake was a very famous wrestler in the '80s and early '90s, who has a massive fan base. He was a very unique uh, individual. But this uh, documentary filmmaker made a movie about how he is now, and he was really bad. He mm. was. You know, he was on drugs. He was living in a in a trailer, like he was destitute. Mm. Um, that's a PR story. Yeah. That is a, that makes sense to me to send out on on a, on a press release because that story will get picked up. Like former WWF mm-hmm. star, you know, on the rocks. Yeah. You know what happens, and it creates another conversation. That to me makes sense. And even then, I would still be hesitant about it. But what do you guys mm-hmm. think of something like that? Again, I think you're still going to get much more mileage if you uh, hire a uh, a good publicist who has those relationships. Who oh, as knows. opposed to just going through PR web. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, and again, a, a press release the way you're talking about it where you're just going through PR web, I just do not think that that's a very Value. valuable. I mean, if you're doing everything else. Why not? Why not? But that shouldn't be step one. No, it should. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Oh, and I think one more one more thing to maybe consider uh, for filmmakers when they're trying to think about uh, advertising and social media versus press release. Where should I put my efforts? Um, social media starts with visual, mm-hmm. whether it's video, image, whatever. If you have strong visuals and strong strong visual content, you're going to have a leg up on social media. Um, if in the exa- hypothetical example of a film that maybe is not as strong on on visuals, um, but has a story to tell about the production, then you might want to lean more on that kind of publicity. Um, I would think. 
Um, and again, that's a very general kind of dynamic, but one way to think about where to be, to be putting your efforts. Well, and, and, you know, and when you're trying to figure that out, <coughs> talking to people, right? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't again, make those decisions in a bubble. Um, talk to other filmmakers, talk to, even talk to some publicists and say, Hey, you know, what, what do you think we should do? And it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to, uh, you know, have a contract with them. They're, they're most likely they're going to come up with some ideas of what to do. Uh, but, but talking to, to, to people who understand that space and, and then coming up with them. Do you, um, do you feel that a lot of old school publicists nowadays have no understanding about social media and can't really, you really use it well? Cause I've, I've run into that. I've run into publicists who are straight up 1985 and they're still doing it all the old ways. And it does work to a certain extent because they have those relationships at the certain, and you'll get press, but is it good or not is another story. But the point is that a lot of them are just not caught up with, oh, I don't use Facebook. Facebook doesn't work because they don't understand it. Possibly. But I mean, the other thing is you're not hiring them to be your social media person. You're right. You should not hire a publicist to do right. that unless they offer it as a package deal. Right. And they have a, another service or right. group right. that does that. Again, you, know, you, you spread yourself too thin if you're trying to uh, be, do a good job at being a publicist and getting that, those articles and those interviews in the right places and, and uh, you know, uh, making sure those relationships you have with uh, reviewers, critics, and journalists um, are still strong, uh, and trying to manage somebody's social media at the same time is too much for mm -hmm. one person. Um, it almost takes a team of people. It does really to to, to do that. And even if it's you're trying to do it yourself, you know, if you're doing the do-it-yourself film distribution avenue. You know, it's it's hard to be doing those things and still working on your next project and and everything like that. It's possible, but it's very very difficult. To, to I, I did it. It's very difficult. Yeah, totally. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> it's um, very difficult. But but I wouldn't. I, I, again, I, I I agree with you that you you uh, some really old school publicists probably don't know social media as well as they they could. Uh, but I do think that they do. Uh, there's a lot of the industry and the journalism uh, that still relies on that way of doing business. And there's still uh, a value in what they bring. Got it. Now, um, can you guys talk a little bit about the reality versus the myth of marketing for filmmakers in general? Because I think there's a lot of myths out there of like, if you do certain things, it'll happen and what the reality of these situations are. Yeah. I mean, the, the, again, the, the myths of how it works, you know, like when, when a filmmaker gets done with a movie and they're the, the, the first thing they think about is like, oh, I need a publicist to, to get people aware of what's going on. I think that's sort of a fallacy. I don't, I, again, a publicist is a piece mm -hmm. of the bigger puzzle, but it's not the one thing they need. And part of it's also, you know, thinking that a publicist also means advertising. It's sort of a muddy area within the film industry. And they're not cheap. That. No. They no, are no. not cheap. Um, Talking about five grand you know, a month if you're lucky right? for a right. good publicist well, in that's, LA. That's the thing also, you know, uh, in the, the indie film space, everybody keeps talking about how much more uh, economical it is to do things today, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's the filmmaking itself or whatever. And it's true. It's cheaper to make a film now than it ever has been, but it still costs money. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're going to shoot on a digital camera there, and then you're going to edit on a computer all, and you, you know, this, mm -hmm. it's not free. No, you know, <laughs> no. At no point has it ever been free. That's true for marketing as well. Right. right. Like the marketing you can do through social media and digitally is cheaper than it's ever been, but it's not free. And, and again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you, when you're making a movie and you want, you know, a good look and you're hiring a, a cinematographer who has a track record, he's not free. You know, um, he or she is not free, not to be the specific he, uh, but that person is not a, it's, you're, you're paying for expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, they know exactly what they're experience. doing. And they're going to give you a quality product. And the same thing happens in marketing. Uh, you know, you want to have people on your team who know that space and it's, you're right. It might be $5,000 a month for a good publicist, but that might be totally worth it and actually a steal depending on, you know, what 
your movie is and what it what it could do. Well, perfect example. I mean, we're going to talk about Sundance and another uh, thing in a little while, but mm-hmm. um, hiring a publicist will get you on every party list. Yeah, will get you into all the gifting lounges. Get yep. you into all the places where there's the guard with mm-hmm. a list, mm-hmm. and you could spend three grand on that. But all of a sudden, your Sundance experience becomes much different. Oh yeah, and you have access to people and things that you did not have before. Mm-hmm. So there's a great ROI if you're going to spend money on a publicist yeah. just to get you into certain places right. at, at, a, at a Sundance. Well, and, and, you know, at Sundance in particular, that's one of the returns on investment. Oh, you know, yeah. You, like, like we were saying, the iron's hot, you must strike. And, and a publicist is a huge part of that equation at a, at a festival like Sundance. Mm-hmm. Um, equally, social marketing is a huge part of that equation at a festival like Sundance or any festival, really. Mm-hmm. Um, because you, a, a lot of the stuff that happens at a, at a festival like Sundance is still talking to the industry. It's not your general audience isn't aware of all that stuff, especially right. when your movie is actually available for uh, viewing somewhere. And, right. and being able to take all that great content and that energy and that buzz and getting it out to a general movie audience who's like, oh, wow, I've heard of this. So like uh, when your movie does come out, it's there's some awareness again it's it's a touch points along the way um sorry so i want to ask you guys the same questions i ask all of my guests uh, kind of rapid fire questions i ask um what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in life or in the business i don't know if i've learned it yet you're still learning i'm still learning okay uh it's a good question uh you know one um one of the things I would say, and I guess it's both business and life, is, uh, and there's a, a really good uh, Seth Godin mm-hmm. quote of course, I yeah. like about it uh, that I'm probably going to butcher right now, but I'll give you the gist. Uh, the cost of doing nothing is greater than the cost of um, doing the wrong thing, mm-hmm. um, right. which is to say, don't wait. Um, Make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, um, you know, more is, more is lost by... Uh, uh, indecision than wrong decision, you know, go ahead and, and try things and, and, and move forward, uh, with whether it be today's project, whatever it is, um, trying out a new platform, trying out a new social media platform, whatever. Um, that took me a while to learn. And, mm-hmm. and I, but I, I, and I'm not confident that I've now correct in, in my <laughs> new approach, but, but, uh, that I th- has, I think has a, been a valuable thing for me. Before I can keep going with these questions, I, there was one thing we forgot to talk about. Uh-oh. Uh, MySpace. Ah, uh, MySpace. Yeah. MySpace. So yes. now everyone listening is going, oh, what the hell are they going to talk about MySpace? With? Right. Let's talk a little bit about what opportunities there might be in a place like a MySpace and, mm. or, or platforms like it. I mean, we're not going to GeoCities and we're not going to start searching on Lycos. <laughs> sure. But, but well, I, yeah, I mean, the, if, if the number one opportunity is, I mean, if you're really into obscurity, mm-hmm. then you can find it in spades <laughs> on MySpace. You got to have, you know, your own little social media island. Number one most obscure. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, but, but, the, but the, the good point yes. we were talking about earlier about like, there, I'm not saying anyone go to MySpace and start marketing their movies, but well, you might want to. I mean, so talk. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. So, I mean, here's what we were talking about earlier. Is, I mean, uh, so I obviously was sort of half joking when I said right. that, but the, I mean, when you're looking for where you should be marketing your film on social media, I mean, what you really want to have in mind is the equation or the ratio of uh, how many people in my target demographic are here to be reached by mm-hmm. me potentially versus how many other people are also trying to reach those people. Mm-hmm. How what's much the competition? competition right. for the, what's the competition for that? Mm-hmm. So it's great if there's a ton of your target demographic on Facebook and they're there. Mm-hmm. But if you know everyone else is also trying to reach that same target demographic, well, it's going to be very hard to reach them. Right. Um, so in in the and we're sort of using MySpace as kind of a hypothetical. Yes, of course, of course. It's a good hypothetical because right. people know it and people also know that it had a very steep decline somewhere around but six, seven, eight years ago. But there's still millions of people that there's, use it. That's the thing. There's still millions of people there. And the question is, have enough of the other, your competing marketers forgotten about a platform like MySpace that the ratio of people to be reached versus competition for reaching those people is now a favorable ratio. Right. And you can go and reach a 
a bunch of people. So, on MySpace. The, so the point is, it's not we're not saying to go market on MySpace. Yes. but what we're saying is that but don't rule it out. Uh huh. But don't rule it yeah. out. I mean, you should. And, and you should also look at multiple other platforms, yeah. well, not just Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. You just, know, just because everybody's in one space doesn't mean that's what you should be doing. And I actually think that plays back to the our conversation about what the sort of old guard of movie marketing. Mm -hmm. sort of thought like just because everybody's doing it one way doesn't mean that that's how you need to be doing it in to market your film the big studios can do things in a certain way that a small indie film just can't yeah and and shouldn't even try to play well i mean and i always use blair witch as the amazing example of how to market an independent film they made they created a complete mystery and aura about their Mm -hmm. movie by creating a fake documentary and a fake all this stuff yeah and, and it, it worked out in spades for them. Right. Yeah. They crushed. So it's it's they crushed looking them. for opportunities. So the MySpace conversation is, you know, right now everybody's talking Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Uh, but, you know, the podcast I listened to this morning was talking about there might be a renaissance of Twitter coming up pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Um, Snapchat. If you're Snapchat's looking, possible. Depending on who your audience is. You're looking for millennials or, or people younger. Totally. That's who you're going to yeah. go. That's what they're using. But yeah. again, if that's, if that's where everybody's thinking – this is how you target millennials. Go to Snapchat. Mm-hmm. But really, then you should be also thinking like, all right, where else are millennials hanging out, or you know, whatever? That's not what everybody else is doing. So yeah. I'm not trying to compete. Tinder, and, and Tinder, totally. Yeah, <laughs> your movie should have a Tinder it's profile. Not a, not a bad Why idea. does your movie not uh, have a Tinder yeah, profile? Your, your Unless it's a documentary yeah. about Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know what? I've never actually even seen the app. I've no, only heard, I've never I've been married for over yeah. ten years, so I've <laughs> right. never I've never actually seen well, an app yeah. on on the screen. Yeah. I've heard of it. I heard there's a swiping thing, but that's all I know. Yeah, no, about yeah. Yeah. Me thinks he does protest too much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know anything about. I it. know nothing, I nothing about it, dear. Not what? It, what? Binder? What? Binder? I've never even heard of that. Uh. Grinder? Is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, all right, so back to our other question. I just thought that was a good point that we forgot to because yeah, right. it, it is something that totally. you know, a, lot of, a lot of people are like, oh, Facebook is the only really place yeah. to go. It's the most powerful. Yeah. And, and there's opportunities everywhere. Totally. Right. And and right. To also like one thing I'd like to add on since we're talking about this subject and also talking about Facebook, a lot of – one thing that is happening with Facebook is Facebook has become more or less a pay-to-play mm-hmm. marketing. Unfortunately. Tool. What has happened in the past couple of years with the new algorithms is – uh, has left a lot of whether you're a filmmaker trying to whatever you're trying to sell whatever you're trying to market um, it has left a lot of those people with the impression that Facebook is essentially dead because they've been using it the way you used it used four or five years ago right. which doesn't work anymore and they're not reaching anyone and even worse than that people will have very commonly these understandable emotional reactions yeah. uh, to they're, Facebook they're a- not I spent this time building this audience and they're not serving my content and they so a lot of people are actually turning away from Facebook because of no, that. I, yeah. the, the, what they're failing to recognize is that what Facebook is giving you in exchange for that is one of the greatest advertising tools ever created. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you learn how to use that, it'll be extraordinarily valuable oh, it's extre- to you. Look, it's extremely annoying yeah. that you post something and, and you, you totally. have, you have a hundred thousand followers and 300 yeah. people see it. Like that's, Yes. That's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But mu- much like MySpace, I feel like there is an opportunity right now in that Facebook has created this advertising tool. Some people are using it, but I think there's still a, a lot of people that need to learn to use it properly. And not Especially a lot of in people this industry. Are, yeah, and not a lot of people are using it properly. So there's an opportunity there as well mm-hmm. to to go reach your target demographic and use Facebook ads well. Mm-hmm. Um, that has a similar sort of desirable ratio that we described right now, at least mm-hmm. that we described when we were using the, the MySpace example. Right. Exactly. So, and what's crazy to me, like I'll even look at. Uh, you know, sort of bigger indie movies, movies that are getting, you know, 300, 600 theater plus release that are still indie movies. And, you know, I go to their social media and they might have 20 followers on Facebook, right? Oh, I've seen that all the time. They're just not using it. And yet, and then they wonder why, you know, the movie doesn't do well at at the box office, you know, because they didn't have the budget that Justice League had to be everywhere. And or billboards even, and buses. Or and even disaster that. artists with right. A24. Like, yeah. you know, if A24 picks up a movie, they usually pump a hell of a lot into well, it. They, they do, but they but also... But it's not Justice League. They also yeah. do creative... Very. Marketing. Yeah. Um, Very and they creative. do a lot with social media in their films. Mm-hmm. Um, A24 is one... And I think that's one of the big reasons why they've been uh, 
have the track record they do and have been as successful as they've been is because they are sort of looking at the marketing of their movies in a much different way than a lot of the other uh, distributors, distributors are. have. Oh, they're a new generation distributor without total totally. question. Um, and it, so it's, but it goes to show that like, you just need to not always stick with like, this is the way it's done. You need to look at how else can we be doing it? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, where, where's the world changed and how do I be part of that and, and be part of the change of the future? You got to look at what's coming. Yeah. You can't look at, and, and we talked about this before. Like, I do believe that Facebook will eventually run its course. I think it will. I think, I don't know when, <laughs> and it, it's hard to say that now, but if you would, if you would have talked back in 2005, that MySpace wouldn't be around well, in, in the way it was. Possibly. Know, well, but Facebook is more than MySpace. In, in ter- oh, much in, more. But like, even they, they diversify, right? Like, I they remember own everything. With yeah. like, uh, yeah, they own a lot of stuff. Instagram, they, they, and yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but even beyond just the social media stuff, Facebook is in a, involved in a lot of other initiatives. Yeah, there's like the Google. Like Google started with totally. now they have phones. Yeah. Now they've got computers coming out. Yeah, totally. And Facebook so, is going to start going down that, that road. Respect. Sure. I don't know that Facebook will ever go away like MySpace because MySpace didn't diversify like yeah. Yeah. Facebook does. And yeah. then grow. Well, right. that's the same yeah. thing with Apple. You know, it wasn't right. just computers. Now they're everything. Yeah, and and some of the other things that Facebook is doing as well. Like for example, I mean competing now for like sports broadcasting right yeah well yeah yeah i mean if if you know they have to get their video player to you know a certain level where they can broadcast in hd broadcast and but that's coming this is on a side this is a side note because you just brought this up and i just wanted this has nothing to do with marketing i just want to ask your opinion Mm -hmm. do you think netflix is going to be around in 10 years yes i do if if apple buys them well, if, yeah. Well, if Apple buys them, then yes. <laughs> yeah. But if they stay, if they stay independent agents, you know, with Disney basically coming up with a competitor, and Disney has big pockets, sure, and they've got a lot sure. of content, sure, for people. I mean, and now they but just they, bought but Disney Fox. doesn't have everything, yeah. right? So, but and they this got is, a lot. They do. But, but let's let's <laughs> sure, even sure. even right now, like I like Netflix. I love, but Netflix. I'm frustrated with Netflix. I am because too. I, it's not the one-stop shop. Absolutely. Right. It's there not, never will be. I well, don't think. Blockbuster was the closest. Sure. You could walk what's into this block, the store. What's this Blockbuster you speak of? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you could walk in and you could you could browse, you could find stuff. And it had TV shows, it had movies, it, it yeah, yeah, yeah. anything from any distribution company from that was any in stock. network. That was in stock. True. <laughs> True. Um but Netflix, you know, they get these deals and it's like they're they're a bigger version of what HBO was, right? Like, you know, they have yeah. their their Yeah, the window of a year of a movie's license. So, so right? things don't live there forever. So Which is annoying. Totally. But that's why until somebody comes up with that one stop shop for digital uh, viewing, you're gonna have to have your Netflix be- and you're gonna have to have Disney. Because yeah. not every Disney won't have everything. Uh, I think where the model is shifting, I think Netflix gets this. Oh, that's why they're is, doing the original content. Exactly. Yeah. It's stuff that it's, they only you, own, you don't need the middleman anymore. No. If you have a streaming platform and you have a developed brand where people are aware of you, and, and better than that, in their case, an existing, a giant existing customer base that are already just signed up. Well, look, I, I, have a, I have a perfect example. I have a friend of mine who runs um, a yoga mm-hmm. uh, a yoga site on, on YouTube. They're like the number one yoga. If you type yep. in the word yoga, I think I told you guys. Yeah. Me. They have a membership site. Yeah, it's a streaming site, and yep. they put out new content for their customers. Yeah, every and they, I can't even tell you. Yeah, how well they're doing. I'm sure. Yeah. It's insane yeah. based on their customer base. So they're gonna. I think there's also gonna be a lot of these little Netflixes, which they're exactly. already out now. Exactly. Totally. I th- I think it's actually gonna go in that direction where you're gonna have more outlets from a, from an audience perspective. I I don't like that. I don't I hate it. Right. I hate it too. Because I, I don't want to have. 10 different bills a month. Oh, God, I know. With like five bucks here, seven bucks there, nine bucks there. One, it's hard to track exactly. I mean, it's Memberships are horrible. Yeah, but, yeah, it's, yeah. but it's like, I don't know what my monthly media spend is, True. right? Because you got signed up. And sometimes you sign up for things and then you never go back to it and then you forget to even have it. And mm-hmm. six months later, you're like, sick of spending right, 80 like, bucks on this damn thing. I totally. don't know about. Um, but I, I think you're absolutely right. That's where it's going to be until somebody figures out the other side of it and says, you know, re- what really will replace cable will be that one subscription that gets you everything. I think what will probably replace all of this stuff is something like an Amazon eventually. Oh, yeah. Where it's just like 
they find, and maybe the thing is like they, well, we're just going to give everyone a free to Amazon TV now. And the only way you can access Netflix or anything else is to have Amazon. And, you know right. what I mean? so and, you're, and you're buying your subscriptions through Amazon. Yeah. So your, your bill is Amazon. Exactly. So it, it'll, and it'll kind of fold back into something like that, yeah. I think. Yeah. That's but, not a bad idea. That's yeah. Not, that's, that's, that's good. Insight. Especially like, yeah, well, it, we'll have your TV delivered by a drone within the hour and installed by robots. And <laughs> you laugh, I mean, but it's not. Oh no, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not laughing because it's not going to happen. I'm, la- I'm laughing because I'm terrified. That, yes. <laughs> uh, it definitely is going to happen. Um, but um, the one thing that I, the, the one positive though I do see in like the having more outlets like this is I do think it lends itself to better content. Oh no, that's whether, very true. You know, like yeah, I think yeah, you're, yeah, we're yeah. getting better TV shows, then you're we're having getting better with movies. each other. Yeah. For and, the subscription. And it also gets to diversify a little bit. Obviously better is a subjective thing. What sure. I think is a good movie is not the same as someone else, but you have more options and, right. and tailored and designed for different tastes. And so I think that's a big plus for personally. content right now. It's, it's a great time to be an audience. Member. Yeah. And also a great oh, time God. to be a, co- a great time to be a content creator. Oh, it's great on true. both ends. Yes. Right, right. You know, like it's, yeah. So I, I think largely it's great. Yes. Personally. Oh, no, no, but, no. I agree. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's just the annoyance yep. of like. For sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wait, it's on that other platform. I don't have that platform. Yeah. This is, this is what we like to call yeah. first world problems. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so just, oh, I got so many yeah. subscriptions <laughs> for my media. Oh, <laughs> yeah. got to watch it on my 85 inch screen. Well, yeah. We are talking about this on a filmmaking podcast. This is yeah. true. This is exactly. No question. All right. So, um. What advice would you give a filmmaker starting on their marketing uh, journey? What's the one piece of advice? Start right now. <laughs> right. Right. Focus on, alongside promoting any of your individual products, promote your filmmaker brand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether that's your name or your production company, put at least as much effort into that as you are at putting into any individual project. And there'll be a lot of overlap. So it's not like it's just going to be double the work, mm-hmm. but have that in mind as, as the long-term goal from a social media, it's certainly from a social media perspective. Got it. Um, and then each of you, three of your favorite films of all time. Fight Club, um, Jeremiah Johnson, and Blade Runner. You know what? That really <laughs> encompasses you 110%, doesn't it? <laughs> When you guys see Adam one day, you'll understand. <laughs> you know, it's really, really, yeah. the three movies are perfect <laughs> representations of Adam's core <laughs> as a human being. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Go ahead, Paul. it's, uh, I, I would go, man, it's tough to pick a three, but I mean, I, I, would, I would say um, American Beauty mm-hmm. is up there, um, Old Boy. Oh yeah, the, the original, version. the original. Not I haven't, the even, Spike, not I haven't the Spike. even seen the new. I've version. never seen the Spike no one either. Yeah. And I love Spike Lee, but I have no intention of seeing a remake of that amazing film. Yeah, everyone should, should just watch the original. There's no need to remake mm-hmm. that movie. Um, and I'm gonna drop real quick. I'm gonna drop uh, some Sundance uh, names here. I was at the Sundance premiere of Old Boy. Wow, with the midnight screening with a director who <sighs> just flew yeah. in. Yeah, from uh, from Asia. And That's cool. damn. And it was. And I sat there, talked to him through his translator. Yeah, outside. At like two oh, thirty in the morning, awesome. and we froze our asses off. Yeah, to get tickets to go see that movie. Yeah. It was it was mind blowing. Yeah, mind blowing to see that movie. Yeah, and just it's so hard to pick like a top three or a top ten, yeah, whatever. Or but here's the movie I've been telling people to see that is definitely high on my list: mm-hmm. uh, a small independent film by uh, Sean Baker called Starlet. Yeah, who also made sure. Tangerine and sure. more recently made which Florida, I Florida seen Project. Yet, Florida Project, but Starlet, mm-hmm. great. Great movie. Yeah, Sean. Sean's been yeah. on the show. He's he's awesome. Oh, well, yeah, oh, yeah. Sean's awesome. been on the show. And we're gonna try to yeah. get, we're trying to get him back from Florida Project. I want to talk to him yeah. about what? how he's making that. More probably more people are hearing about him now. Obviously, but right. and I would Tangerine, say go, yeah, Tangerine, go, was, Tangerine was big. Go back and watch Starlet. Yeah, I thought I love that movie. He's a great, great. filmmaker. Yeah. He's a really really he's yeah. he's one of those guys you got to keep an eye out. Yeah, for absolutely. Before. Guys, thank you so much for dropping some knowledge bombs on the audience. But first of all, tell us a little bit uh, before we go about what you guys do and who Media Circus is. So Media Circus, um, essentially what we, what we want to be. Um, a couple years ago, uh, there was a book out um, by John Rice talking mm-hmm. about uh, producer of marketing and distribution. Sure. Right? Essentially, we want to, we're a services-oriented company to help with those things. We uh, we're a sister company with Circus Road Films, which is uh, uh, film 
rep, uh, producer rep, and film sales agents. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that you know your film needs marketing and it needs distribution, and and we're trying to provide those things for filmmakers because we see that you know most films uh, in the indie space they get put onto platforms and then nobody ever knows that they exist, even though a lot of them are really good films and be things that people audiences would really like to know about. So that's what we want to do is to help that process. And where do you guys, uh, where can people get a hold of you guys? Mediacircus.com? Mediacircuspr.com. Mediacircus.film. The, the website. Mediacircus.film is also ours. It's all the same. But okay. Yeah. Um, but really find us on Facebook, Twitter, um, Media Circus Film, um, Media Circus Film Marketing. It's funny. I don't even like your own phone number. Nobody knows your own phone number. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, Instagram. I'll put them in the links. I'll put it in the <laughs> Media in the Circus notes, Film uh, on Instagram. Uh -huh. Find us there for sure. Uh, and Media Circus on Facebook. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Cool. Guys, thank you again so much for uh, for taking time to, to uh, drop some knowledge bombs on the on the tribe, man. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Our Alex. pleasure. Yeah. And we'll uh, we'll see you guys all at Sundance. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're gonna be seeing a lot of us at Sundance. Yep. So <laughs> I, I can't wait to to tell you guys all the cool stuff or show you guys. Yeah. All the cool stuff we have planned for you at this year's Sundance. It's gonna kind of. I think it's gonna kind of blow away what we did last year. Oh yeah, which last year was pretty intense, but we didn't know what we were doing last year. We were just like, "Hey, let's go shoot some stuff," and we got some amazing guests, and it was great. But this year, uh, it's gonna be pretty intense. So, uh, if you guys are out at Sundance, look us up. We'll be around, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. As promised, this was a knowledge bomb packed episode. I hope you guys took some notes. And after the episode, I sat down with Adam and I said, hey, you know, is there something you can give the uh, the tribe uh, it's special because they're part of the tribe? And they said, he goes, absolutely. He decided to offer all of the Indie Film Hustle tribe a free consultation on their film. So if you got a feature film out there and you want to get it out into the world, Give these guys a call and they will give you that free consultation. And if you want to get links to everything we talked about in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 213. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And uh, as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.